Doctor, and welcome. Welcome back to our fourth hour story time here at Dabs, whether you're viewing our YouTube channel or listening in on our podcast. We thank you for tuning back in with us on this evening. Wow. We're so grateful also to the facilities that they went to us here at the Hannah Center. Come on out and check them out. They're located right here at 4750 Woodward Avenue in Detroit and, of course, Michigan. Black History Month. Hmm. And that's because, you know, black history, it truly does matter. And to help us celebrate on this evening, we have three sensational storytellers, Vicki, Shakita, and James. And like I said, they're here to help us celebrate you know, what's known as Black History Month, but Black History truly just matters. Now, with that theme of Black History, I just wanted to kind of give a little background on that. Black History was actually established, you know, uh, back in 1926 by Dr. Carter G. Woodson. It was established as Negro History Week. Black History Month is now celebrated, you know, from February 1st to March 1st. The reason why he picked that first week in February is because the birthdays of Abraham Lincoln as well as Frederick Douglass are both within sound of that first week in February. Now, um, they gave many, many contributions to the African American history, and so Dr. You know, Woodson saw it being on the thing that he recognized the both of them. And as we know, it's for a month now. But here's what I want to just kind of highlight. Yes, we celebrate all the accomplishments. We celebrate a whole lot within that month. But this is what does it for me. It is a time, yes, a time to reflect on the struggles, the criticisms, as well as the systematic racism and day discrimination that those very same folks that would celebrate and do it every day of their entire lives. Mm. Well, I thank them. And um, we're going to also learn a little bit about some of those celebrations of some of those <coughs> Americans that's going to be happening on today. We're going to uh, allow you to listen course to learn. It is a time to ask questions within the sound of your families, a time for education on how those lives impacted our lives on today. Um, impactions such as joys as well as hurts. And so we're going to kick it off with one of our elders to help us celebrate. We will either hear joys or hurts or either both. Elder Vicki Slaughter. Elder Vicki Slaughter is a retired educator who worked in special education for more than 35 years. She did that promoting enjoyment of reading through playmaking for most often nonverbal student actors. And after 15 years, she was awarded a fellowship in African literature at the University of Wisconsin that allowed her to continue to write and develop many stories. As a matter of fact, she continues to work by hosting DAB's annual December Holiday Storytelling Festival by alternating between the Michigan Children's Museum and Detroit Public Libraries. 19 years and counting. Ooh. Come on, Elder because you know we're still counting on you. Hello, my name is Lady Vicki Slaughter, and today I'm going to share two stories with you. The first one is about the Tuskegee Airmen. As you see today, I have on my Tuskegee Airmen jacket. jacket. I belong to the Macon Jackson uh, Tuskegee Airmen. 
when I was a younger woman, I used to see these men, elegantly dressed men, in these turquoise blue jackets. But I never knew who they were, and I never thought to say or ask who they were. These men were husky airmen from Detroit, and their jackets were blue. My jacket, I'm from Southfield, is gold. So today I'm going to share with you the story of the Tuskegee Airmen. It was 1939. It was during the midst of the Depression. The Depression was occurring all over the world. People were out of work and they were starving. In America, four, one out of every four people unemployed. There was a lot of trouble, a lot of resentment. Anyway, during that time we had FDR as our president. He decided to institute some programs that would help uh, the people with jobs. In other countries, such as Nazi Germany, they decided that the reason why there were no jobs and things were so hard that it was because of a group of people. So in 1939, Italy and Germany were playing Mother May I. And you remember that game, you said, Mother, may I take a baby step or a giant step? Well, this is what Italy and Germany did. Italy decided to expand this country and attack North Africa, Abyssinia, which is now Ethiopia. No one really wanted to get involved in the war, so England and France and the United States, they really didn't say anything. They did not complain. So then Russia, um, Germany said, okay, I'm going to do the same thing. So they took the Rhineland and they took Austria. Still, there was no complaint. FDR was watching what was going on. And he decided that he needed to start training air pilots, airplane pilots. So he did. And the, and the black community and the NAACP wanted uh, black pilots. During World War I, there were no black pilots allowed. They did some testing in 1925 and said uh, black men could not physically, emotionally, or intellectually fly an airplane. So we know that that's not true. But it was time for FDR to be reelected. So he made these promises to the black community, to the NAACP, that he would train black airplane pilots. So when he started training uh, white pilots at different colleges and universities before the war started, then certain colleges like Tuskegee Institute was open to training uh, civilian pilots. So time passed, and then the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941. So immediately, those universities and those colleges, they started training pilots for real to go into the Army. The only problem was that the difference was that the black soldiers had to have a college degree. They couldn't get married. They, they, were, they couldn't go into town. They couldn't go into the communities. Uh, at the colleges, even though they were black colleges, they could not uh, share. Everything was segregated. So things were really kind of tough. Um, the black, the black uh, pilots, not only did they have their college degree, but they had to go through the training program three times. 
once they were trained, then they just sat around. And, uh, but no one was uh, brave enough to put them into the war. So finally, the Tuskegee Airmen were sent to North Africa and Italy and Sicily. And they began bombing different, uh, they bombed on the ground, they bombed uh, submarines, ships, but they weren't ever really invited to fly and be with the bombers. So finally, they were invited to escort the, the bigger planes, and they found that they only lost seven planes, bombers, throughout the whole war, where usually when a, a bomber would go out and it was uh, maybe three or four hundred bombers would go out, they would lose at least 46. That was the average. So this is where this myth came from, that the Tuskegee Airmen didn't ever lose any bombers, but they did. It's recorded as seven. Next, finally before the war, there was a big push to bomb Berlin, Germany. And so the Tuskegee Airmen were supposed to just escort the bombers half the way. But then the other bombers that were so the, the, the squadron that was supposed to uh, meet them and take over, they didn't show up. So the Tuskegee Airmen, they escorted the bombers all the way to Berlin. Well, then there was this big fight. The Germans had introduced jets. And so the Tuskegee Airmen, they were the first one to, uh, to knock down a jet out of the sky. And they knocked down a total of three that day. Well, towards the end of the war, um, in 1945, they started not having too much work left. They came home, and once they, uh, were on the ground, the white uh, pilots were told to go one way, and the black ones were both told to go the other way. At Tuskegee, they closed down the whole school because they said, no, we have to have, we can leave it open, but we have to have white people, instructors, and officers over the program. Well, anyway, it closed. And then in 1946, they got rid of the whole program. But then, guess what President Truman did? Because of the performance of the Tuskegee Airmen and other African Americans in Germany and in the Pacific, he integrated the Army and the Armed Forces finally. So, anyway, so the in 2007, um, President George W. Bush, he congratulated the Tuskegee Airmen, and he gave them a gold citation. And what he said, he saluted them. And he said, um, this is for you, Tuskegee Airmen. And he gave them a salute because this is one of the things that the Tuskegee Airmen and the black officers found that they were not respected, they were not saluted. They fought a war on two, two grounds. They fought it in Europe and the Pacific, and then they fought it at home. So again, Tuskegee Airmen, this is for you, Spitfire. Thank you. My second story I'm going to tell you about is um, Sojourn of Truth. Sojourn of Truth, initially when I read her life, I couldn't tell it because it was so painful. The physical abuse, the sexual abuse, 
that she suffered, but she still was a strong woman and kept on, and she wasn't, she didn't resent anything. So I'm going to enter, start my story as she goes into a meeting. She would go walk around, she's an adult now, her children have grown, but she would walk around preaching God's word. She would go to these meetings and she would go and speak, and this is where you hear her, her famous speech, Ain't I a Woman? But in this one particular day, she was sitting there listening to the speakers and a whole crowd, more than a hundred young white men broke into the tent that they were having the meeting in and they started yelling, where is that Sojourner Truth? Where is she? We want her! And you know, I'm going to take my storytelling license and tell you how I feel that she might have felt. She got up and she started looking for a way out. But you know when your life is in danger and jeopardy, your life kind of flies through your mind really quick. So she, she thought about how when she was a little girl with her parents, and, and life had been good, even though they were enslaved, until her, her uh, first master died, the plantation owner. And she had, her family was given to the son. She was sold to the first, second person to earn her. And there she was, overworked. She was beaten because she, all, she didn't speak English. She only spoke. Dutch. And the people that owned her only spoke Dutch to them because they knew that their slaves could not run away and escape if they didn't speak the language. So every time she tried to talk and she didn't speak English, then she was beaten. They, the men took liberties with her. And sometimes when I think about her, I I think she must have sang this song. Born before 17, 
1897 by 18, July 4th of 1827. And she wasn't free. So she decided, I'm going to take my freedom myself. And she walked away. And she took one baby with her. She had had a really hard life. <clears throat> when she was 15 years old, she was in love with another slave that was from another plantation. But because the children would not be owned by that slave master, he beat her, 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 her friends so badly that he eventually died in a few years from that beat. So they gave her an older man, um, and she had five children by him. But then, like I said, she decided that she didn't get her freedom when she was supposed to, so she decided she would just walk away. And once she walked away, she, she met a lot of different people. She met ministers, she met groups, the seven-day Adventists. And she would stop and she would live with them for a few years of study. She never learned to read or write. But she would have not adults read her because they would try to explain to her what the Bible meant. And, and she didn't want them to explain because she felt that God would tell her. When she was fasting one day, God told her to go and preach. And she changed her name from Isabella Bonfrey to Sojourner Truth. And that's what she did. She walked. She left New York and she walked all over the country. And she studied. So then we go back to the tent. So she finally finds a slit in the tent, and she's able to escape. So she goes out up on a hill, and she's so happy that she's safe, that she starts to sing. And she had gotten away by then. But when she started to sing, the, the men found her again, and they rushed upon her more than a hundred people. And then she says, stop, what have I done to you? And they said, oh, lady, we just came to hear you sing. We came to hear you talk. We came to hear you pray. And so she said, well, I can't talk. I can't sing. You're too close up on me. So they backed up. And she joked about how the ministers got the lambs, but she got the goats. And the men laughed. And then they put her up on the wagon, for she sang for more than an hour. And then they asked her to keep talking and keep singing. And they asked her questions about God. And she says, well, I've talked and I've sang for an hour. I need to go now. And they said, no, no. She said, I'll sing one more song. But all of you have to promise that you're going to part and go. So they all agreed. So, like I said, I'm taking us a license. I know she sang hymns, but I don't know the hymns that she sang. So with my storyteller license, I'm going to sing just a little bit of this song. Right on, King Jesus, no man shall I hinder him. Can I hinder 
for the return of her son Peter. They had been sold down river in slavery. And once when um, um, a bus driver threw her off the bus. But she finally, she moved to Battle Creek. And that's where she finished her life out and died. So thank you for listening to my story. If no one tells these stories, who will? Like I said, I had no idea who these men in the blue suits were. And no one had a program to tell us who they were. Thank you for listening. I'm the licensed very breathtaking. Thank you. Thank you. You said earlier that you couldn't tell her story years ago. How were you able to get to the point where you were able to share that story? Well, I looked at how strong mm -hmm. she became. She didn't let the abuse, both physically and sexually, destroy her. Uh, she sought God, and that was her strength. Mm -hmm. And she never, she didn't ever learn how to read. She couldn't read maps, but she would just ask God, which way should she go? And He led her, in which, in which the way that she would go. And I just, I admired the strength that she showed. She went on the court. Mm -hmm. She sued twice, mm -hmm. and this is in the 1800s during uh, slavery time. Um, so I, be I began to admire her mm -hmm. as I studied mm -hmm. and read more. Thank you for sharing that information. You did such a wonderful job to take us back in that time for her time. And she changed her name. Why did she change her name? She changed her name because she said she had been fasting. Mm -hmm. And uh, God spoke to her. Mm -hmm. And um, she would fast, I think she said she had fasted for almost four days, mm -hmm. to the point where um, she was just voracious. And when she went to get something to eat, she got uh, bread, and mm -hmm. she said she was just eating it so fast that she said, well, she didn't want uh, God to think that she <laughs> valued this bread more than him. Okay. But then it came to her that she was supposed to speak his truth. Okay, and that she was supposed to walk about and tell it. So she was so, so supposed to sojourn, mm -hmm. sojourn, mm -hmm. and speak. And um, this is what she did. And as she, as she did this, she learned. She mm -hmm. studied. Mm -hmm. You know, she got into trouble. She was accused of murder, and she was cleared of that. Um, People, she would save her money. She always made good money because she worked hard, and she would put her money in the bank. But then they said, "Oh no, come put your money with us." And so she found that, in after a while, she was just like totally broke and didn't have enough money to live off of. So she had to learn how to take care of herself. Mm -hmm. And then another thing, mm -hmm. um, she did not have children. I mean, adults read to her. She had children because as many times as she said, read it over to me, till she memorized it, they would. Again, thank you so much for the information. Joy hurts reading to know. And speaking of reading, reading to know, how would you be able to be reached if um, someone wanted to reach out to you to come and tell your stories for them? Um, you can reach me at Ms. M S Vicky Slaughter at gmail dot com. So Ms. M S Vicky V I C K I E Slaughter S L A U G H T E R at gmail dot com. Well, Vicky Slaughter, Elvis Slaughter, thank you, and you certainly are licensed. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Wow. Let's keep the celebration going. Our next teller, known as C. 
let's see what Shakita has for us on today. Let's see. Shakita McKenzie, better known as C, did not grow up talking a lot, but she did grow up watching, listening, learning piano, flute, and she wrote stories. She wrote them so much so, she became a published author as a freshman in college. Now, with a total of two authored books, she continued on to embrace a love for oral communication by participating in Toastmasters International Competition with Speaking Contest. Wow. Not only has she written and directed her play titled Brothers Near and Afar, she also performed and directed a play of an award-winning playwright. Well, all right. Let's kick back, relax, to see and or hear what C has to say. Hello, how are you? This particular Fourth Friday Story Hour, I'm going to do two things for you. One, give you a story. Two, talk to you about some things. And you may want to take some notes. You may not. You want, may want to commit it to memory. But it's all about strategy, I say. Why? Black History Month talks about things that people had to do. Black History Month talks about accomplishments. In order to have an accomplishment, you have to have a strategy. There was a young man who, whether you took it from this side of him, if he stood over here, and then there was a young lady, and whether you took it from this side and she stood over here, they didn't know each other initially, but eventually they came to know each other. Now, the young man who is so well known because he was appointed to the Supreme Court Justice by then President Lyndon Johnson, he, however, was not born a Supreme Court Justice, but that is what people know him as. He actually went to Howard, he graduated from law school, and he began his quest on changing the United States on behalf of African Americans which at that time were referred to as blacks or Negro. If you look at the papers back in the mid-50s, the early 50s, 52, 56, you'll see headlines that says, President appoints Negro to Supreme Court Justice. At the University of Alabama, Negro lady tries to get into school. So it was a term that was used because back then, African American is a term that did not exist. However, when the young lady, <coughs> whose name is Arthur and Lucy, decided to get a graduate degree, she filled out a form, she turned it in, she sent the five dollars, and she waited for a response. She was admitted. But the first time she was admitted, they realized, wait, she can't go here. So she was on one side, the white administration was on the other side. Why can't she go here? Well, you're a Negro. You can't go here. Now, you can go down to Montgomery or somewhere else, and you can leave the state, but you can't go here. And so they pulled back her admission. She waited. She already had an associate's degree. She already had a bachelor's degree, but she wanted a graduate degree. And when she walked back home, and she was born down in Shiloh, Alabama, she walked back home and she went on with her life and then she decided that she would apply to UAB once again. This time, she was admitted. Now you have to wonder, how did they forget that she was black? Not a problem. She took the admission, she went to school, and with her books in hand, it was the first day. Little did she know that clearly, I'm going to say, the admissions director didn't tell anybody else on campus because when she arrived, they had this person called Dean of Ladies. And the Dean of Ladies took care of the girls, such that you needed to go to class or you needed something, some information, they would do that for you. 
At that time, you didn't roam all over the place by yourself getting things. Escorts were all the rage, but they were a lady. They would tend to you. So the dean of ladies ended up having to tend to Arthurine. But when she tended to her, it was because she was a Negro, not because she was a student. What do I mean by that? Well, Arthurine's strategy was to apply. She had good grades, and so she got in. Her next strategy was to go to campus, be on time, arrive the first day, be ready with book in hand to go to class. Little did she know, the strategy of the white students was to make sure she never got there. Now, they couldn't keep her from driving up the highway to get to the campus. But at the point in time she put her foot on the soil of that campus, which is in the state where she was born, that she had worked and where she had gotten degrees, they saw fit to have her removed. The dean of ladies had a horrible time on her hand. Why? When you have a mob, mobs don't tend to stop and say, oh wait, we just want the black one. We don't want the white one. The white one is supposed to be with us. So both of them were together in all of that fit of rage. Three days of this. Three days of this, and Arthurine was just trying to open a book and get an education. Little did she know, she would have to go to a strategy she had not planned to use, because she felt that because they admitted her twice now, that everything was well. But on that third day, she was on campus. She was going to her class. The dean of, of ladies had gotten to the point where she had to drive her to class. She could not freely roam the campus. So the last time that she drove her to class, and when Arthurine was down in Nashville at the First Amendment Center, she told the story that the dean told her, I'm going to let you out. You're going to go to class. And not only are you going to go to class, but you're going to run up those stairs. Why does she need to run? Because the mob, Arthurine said, was at her heels, almost to the point where she could feel them breathing. They were yelling at her, they were telling her to get out, to go home, to do whatever it is that mobs tell folks to do, other than what the singular person is there to do. She said there was a mob of almost 300 students, plus their parents, that were trying to get rid of her. And if it was through death, so be it. If it was through hurting her, so be it. If it was any way that they could get her off that entire campus, they didn't want her on the campus at all. But she ran, and she said she got in that building, and she was on those stairs, and she thought to herself, what did I do? They admitted me. I didn't demand it. I merely submitted the application like all the folk. Well, she said that's when she stopped, and she prayed to God and said, if you want me to do this, if you want me to be the first black person to attend the University of Alabama, just let me know and I'll do it. She didn't quite recount how she got out of that building, but clearly it wasn't easy. The dean of students may have come back and gotten her, the dean of ladies may have come back and gotten her, but she lived. She also came to the understanding, as she took another strategy where she had to go back once again, so she thought. But instead of going back, Thurgood Marshall appeared, Attorney Marshall, and he took up her case. Now he had already handled the case of Brown versus Board of Education at 54, which he won unanimously. So he knew strategy. I've been told by an older person that what Thurgood did was if he ever went into court and you were ever facing him, you wanted to make sure he did not take off his suit coat. Because if he did, you might as well get ready to lose. His strategy was that I'm going to be blunt with you, I'm going to be clear with you, you're going to understand what you've done wrong, and that a young lady who simply wanted an education could possibly have a result of being killed by a white mob of which you say are your students. But then what are you teaching your students? How are you teaching them to handle the world? Is this your answer to everything? Now mind you, a graduate student is only about 21, 
22? What in the world could a 21-year-old do to an entire campus? Well, they decided she would ruin it. Her mere existence would ruin it. But Thurgood said, no, it won't. Quite frankly, she already has two degrees, and she just wants to come and get another one from you. So as Thurgood stood and looked at the court, and Arthurine was there, of course, being the defendant, his strategy was so subtle that it caused them to make the wrong decision, and you will show how mean-spirited you are. Just like in 54, Thurgood and his team waited, and the decision came back. She won. Thurgood won almost 32 of all the cases he ever had, which is part of how he ended up being appointed to the Supreme Court of the United States. He decided that if I'm clear, not that I seek to embarrass you, but if you're wrong, you're wrong. After a while, Arthurine got situated after she waited for the mob to calm down, and she went back to the University of Alabama, and she graduated with the degree that she wanted. And the beautiful thing about this particular graduation, because they both worked the strategy of time and place and waiting, you notice they, did never, they never raised their voice. They went to court. On this particular day, when she graduated, not only did she walk across the stage of the school that wanted to get rid of her by death if necessary, but her daughter walked across the stage with her. She recounted that story and the loveliness of it when she was at the First Amendment Center as well. And I was very happy to have the opportunity to walk into a room and see history in actuality and talk to Arthurine. Thank you. Now, my second story that I want to tell you, I want you to come and sit down. And I want to read a poem to you that I wrote. And as you can tell, as I said, black history is about race relations. It's not always about racism, per se, but it is about race relations. But this is a time where we get to tell folk, this is what I'd like from you. This is what I'd like you to do. Now, my grandmother was born in 1908. It wasn't a lot of choices for her, but she made her choices. She was very strategic. She lived off the land. She managed not to spend money, but she had money because they earned money. How do I know this? It's all recorded in the court records where they bought and they sold houses and paid off mortgages. So she had a plan, and it was what she was leaving for us. And now I want to talk to you about a gift I'd like you to leave for me and whomever else is on the earth and whomever else might come after me. Not long ago, I was told of some sheets. I was told they were washed made into hoods so they could see. I wondered and I thought, there is something she knew, born to us in 1908. We called her Needs, but other folk knew her by Louise. But we can not say her name, and thus her name became Needs. She never spoke ill, even of those in sheets. My ears, they once heard and remember still the words that she spoke. She would tell us, baby, some folk just sick in the head, let them be. Let them be was a strategy of safety. Let them be got you back home. Let them be gave you a chance to tell the grown folk what happened so they could tell you where not to go until such time it was okay. Inward toward my growth, I prepared to speak and knew that even without the sheets, they would listen to me. You said, I have, have a belief and had a belief that regardless to what you have on, regardless to what implement I see, I can still talk to you and you will be rational 
and come to understand. For I mean no harm, I seek to understand. You think some are not worthy, but you expect we praise our God to whom we all speak? So this is what I want, and this is why this poem is titled, Leave a Gift for Me. So leave a gift for me, both sides of the morning. Remove all that you hate. Please start internally. Realize that the gift I seek, I need you to give truth that all can be greater and interchangeable. I shall be here when you leave. I'd like no semblance of sheets. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Decide what you want. Make it a gift to the next generation and the current generation. And through strategy, let us end all of this hate.
celebration, hurts, pains, and then you alone. Next up, last but not least, is James Graham. Thank you, James. James Graham is a master storyteller that grew out of reading bedtime stories to his children. He now finds a major driving force to continue storytelling as a means of leaving a spiritual legacy to his grandchildren. Beginning in 1993, with trips to elementary schools, the career aspect of storytelling has included various venues, including churches, prisons, concerts, camps, funerals, and workshops. Now, if you listen closely to his stories, his hope is you will experience his attempt to spirit whisper. Good afternoon. As she said, my name is James Graham. And to celebrate, to celebrate Black history, uh, we need to kind of uh, change the atmosphere somewhat. Pay a little homage to to appreciate to, to 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 pay honor to those who who poured into our lives the symbolism here it's an old west african tradition wherein we water a plant in, in this instance a tree uh, the reason for the tree is because a tree not only changes the atmosphere by pulling out carbon dioxide and filling it with oxygen life-giving oxygen some trees also give fruit. Now, the thing with it is, once this tree gives off the oxygen and the fruit, when it is no longer biologically alive, the wood it leaves behind builds homes, makes canes, and even provides wood for fireplaces. It keeps you warm, protects you, and helps you keep going. It's a way for us to live our lives. Now, these, in the way that I'm watering this, this tree, the symbolism here is to give honor for those people who watered my life, who who poured into my life, and who changed the atmosphere for me, changed the environment so that I could live, and, and they've given me something to. Help me, keep me warm, and protect me, and keep me going. So in the name of all of those before, those great ones, those who changed the atmosphere for us all, the, the Sojourner Truths, the, the Tuskegee Airmen, the, the Third Good Marshals, in the name of the Harriet Tubmans, and, and in the name of the James Grahams, my father, and, and, and the Louise Graham Davis is my grandmother. In the name of Tone's mother and, and, and in your grandmother and your great grandmother and your aunts and your uncles, in the name of all of those, as I pour into this, I say Ashe and please, in your mind, say Ashe too. It'll just take a little while to really let their names and their hearts and their souls and our appreciation for God, for the gift he gave us through them. Let that sink in. As I continue the celebration of black history, I want to take you to Sea Islands, Georgia, on the coast of South Carolina. You see, uh, up and down Sea Islands, Georgia, there, there, is a, there, there, there are people uh, called the Gullah. Ah, rich oral tradition, the Gullah. And, and, and around, I think around in Georgia, Sea Islands, Georgia, the Gullahs are there. And they'll tell you, they'll tell you about a certain little place. <laughs> if you go and you ask, ah, oh, boy, ain't you never heard? <laughs> Down here on Dunbar Creek by the Dunbar River, it's a place they call Ebo Cross. See, the word is that uh, one of those slave ships uh, it, it come over from West Africa. Now, the 
a lot of those people who were enslaved within that ship, they took over the boat. They managed to bring it up on shore. And there they came when they saw, when they came on the coast and they saw slavery and they saw what they were being brought into, they decided it was not for them. They decided this was not the life that they, that they wanted. That they knew they were evil. And so they all got together and they sang those songs and they told everybody they was going to be free or die. And as we take a little, a little storytelling license, you can just about hear that they have their own little songs. Very proud group of people they evolved. But you could just hear them. And before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave. And go home unto my Lord and be free. A lot of people die at evil crossing. They died because they knew who they were. It's hard to enslave a man who knows who he is. The reason why that is important for us to know is it's time for us to tell our children who they are. The new form of slavery is drugs and ignorance. And as, as a person who has worked with the MD with the Michigan Department of Corrections, with the National Lifers Association, I have seen where this new slavery leads. And it is not for our people, so it is time for us to tell our children who they are. Now, those gullahs, I, I, I want to kind of, I, I want to invite you into the life of them a little bit. Yeah, Baba Jamal, a friend of mine, went down to South Carolina. He did a lot of interviews, and, and he got a lot of their stories. And he, even, well, uh, among the Gullah, there, there's there a lot of gold, uh, for a lot were from the Gullah region in Africa. And they are, they are kind of related to a lot of Liberians. Now you see, there was a uh, Lorenz Graham, Lorenz Graham, who went to Liberia, and he wrote a lot of stories based on the Liberians. Now, the pigeon speak that Lorenz Graham brings forth in his dialect, in his writing, is similar to that of the Gullahs. And, and I want you to kind of hear this and, and, and feel this. See, this is the Liberian story of Jesus. And before I go into this, please let me explain a little something. The Liberians have a cognate word called Pekin, similar to the Spanish Pequeño. Pequeño is ooh, blessing. It's an endearing term for the children. The Liberians refer to their children as the Pequeño. Can you see the overseers hearing the Liberians calling their children little Peking? And with that southern accent, change it to Pekinini. Something endearing turned into something else. But with that to the side, let's venture into Louis Graham's story of Jesus. Long time past, huh? Long time past. Long before uh, your pa lived. Long before him pa lived. Long before him lived. At that time, God lived. And him go to the town where the people be. And the kind talk, they took the nonsense and never in. And got hard vexed. And God took it. Never mind. Never mind my people. They don't walk my way. I'm going to break the world of it. 
I'm going to lose the people which I didn't care for. I'm going to put water that side where land be. I'm going to put land that side where water be. I'm going to make the day dark. I'm going to make the night cold. I'm going to break the world and build a new nation and a new people. And him small son. <laughs> him to keep. Him to hear God's word. And him grieve the people. And him talk to him, Paul! I come for to beg you, don't break the world which you done make. Don't lose the people which you done give. But make it um, I go. I go walk with people. I go talk with people and by and by they don't stop me. They will know your way. And slowly and softly the king go down and then grab God for you. God hardly down. Yes, and God talks in my son. When you beg me so, my heart can know best. So let me, but hear me and hear me good. If you go, you will be born as a man. You will walk like a man. You will talk like a man. You will feel hunger, you will feel thirst. And by and by the people, they spill your blood, they kill you, they kill you dead. And I know go put my hand in it. But the king said, But Paul, if be my blood is to spill, make it become an everlasting sea of life for them souls to walk away. And so it was. So God looked down on earth and him find Mary to bring forth him the king. But Mary be no wife to Joseph. So when Joseph, see Mary belly grow big like this, and him looked at himself. Joseph vexed. But God talks to Joseph. Never mind. Never mind, Joseph. This one, the God Palara. This one, the God the King. And Joseph's heart lay down. And God, sent angels, talks to Make glad all people. God's be king, be born in Bethlehem. And all people say, ah, and king come, bring gold and wine oil, and people bring the rice. And God the king born. <laughs> and then walk with men, and then talk with men, and then show man God way. And by and by the people, they spill in blood. They kill him, they kill him dead. But on day three, <laughs> And rise up from dead until dead by bye. And must sin in the heaven. Papa got home in the sky, but him sitting down holy spirit. And lead people, guide people, show people the right way. Help them in how they walk. And how they talk. And how they pray. So hear what I say next. And heed to it. My brother, my friend, open up your heart and let Papa God's Spirit come in. That, that, that was, uh, that was kind of the James Graham version of the Lorenz Grahams. Every man heart lay down. It was told originally for Easter Day. It was told to urge all souls to walk God's way. Now, my mentor, a friend of mine, Baba Jamal Karam, it went down and did several interviews in South Carolina coast. He got their legends of John the Conqueror. And he wrote down a little poem for John the Conqueror. You know, it was, who's that down with a rude bitch? <laughs> hey. Who's that uh, whispering in the wind? Who's that saying, let me in? Must be our John, the conqueror. Oh, oh, John be big. <laughs> no, no, John be small. No, John ain't being nothing at all. You see, he's here with us when hope and gone and the spirit is low and he has long. Who's that saying, let me in? Must be our John, the conqueror. They say, John come over from Africa. Walking on them waves, full laughter. John Bray home to where his soul. He opens our eyes to the lies being told. John give you comfort in the crippled pain.
change. This is the rules of whips and chains. Who's that saying? Let me in. Was Bihar John. The conqueror. See, John the conqueror was that connection to their creator for people that are very hard on their lives. You see, through John, they were given the hope and the inspiration and the strength to bear that that was put on them. And they were given a little something to look for tomorrow that to them didn't seem very right to them. But who's that down where? Where the road bends? Who's that down? Thank you. 
for attending tonight's program presented by the Detroit Association of Black Storytellers. All rights of Dab's Fourth Friday Story Hour is a copyright of the Detroit Association of Black Storytellers and cannot be rebroadcasted or re-recorded without the written permission or consent of the Detroit Association of Black Storytellers Incorporated. If you miss any of tonight's performance, you can tune into Dab's podcast or replay on Buzzsprouts or whoever your podcast provider is or come here the Detroit Association of Black Storytellers YouTube page subscribe, it's free if you live in the Detroit area and have an interest in becoming a storyteller, please contact Dabs at dabsstorytellers at gmail.com that's dabsstorytellers at gmail.com or call 313-442-3227. That's 313-442-3227. If you happen to live outside of the Detroit area 
and interested in becoming a storyteller, please visit the National Association of Black Storytellers website or call 410-947-1117 or email at questions at nabsinc.org. That's either call 410-947-1117 or email at questions at nabsinc.org. Nabs will connect you with a storytelling association in a city near you. Hey everyone, the Detroit Association of Black Storytellers are so pleased you joined us tonight for Dab's Fourth Friday Story Hour, Black History Month celebration. Remember, Black history is world history. Coming next month, Friday, March 24th, 2023, at 7 p.m. with doors opening at 6.55, right here in Detroit Association of Black Storytellers YouTube page. Take a minute and subscribe to our page so that you don't ever miss the program starting time. It's free to, to, to subscribe. Next month, we have three amazing storytellers as they bring in March Madness. Janice Burnett, Leah Rich, and Michelle Peary with your host, Pamela. Again, thank you for joining us on our Black History Month celebration. Black history is world history with elder Vicki Slaughter, master storyteller, Shakita McKenzie, and brother James Graham with your host, Pamela Williams. Our music director is Michelle McKinney. Our video tech director is brother James Graham. Production engineer is Jasmine Ross, and program director is Tom Ross. Along with the Detroit Association of Black Storytellers, we thank you for attending Dab's Fourth Friday Story Hour. See everyone March 24, 2023 20, at 7 p.m. for March Madness. Please be safe, peace and blessings, and to all you, until next time, Ashe and Asante Sala. If you've enjoyed any of our broadcasts last season, 2022, and this season, 2023, we'd like you to take a moment and send a donation so that we can keep bringing you these amazing programs and stories, such as tonight. It is as simple as you going to PayPal, bring up the Twitter Association of Black Storytellers, and donate. All donations are tax deductible. Your gift will highly be appreciated. Again, good night, be safe, until next time.